Welcome to the continued podcast adventures of Superhero Speak. But I think many of the people that love this character and that love superheroes in general have used these stories as inspiration to say, you know what, I'm going to do something good in the world. I'm going to make a difference like my hero when I was a kid. That is my fondest memory of it because when, you, when you're doing comic books, you want them to affect people. Right. You bring people to care. You want, you want to strike emotions. And I knew that that clone saga was striking a lot of emotions. Can you yeah. imagine uh, Pulp Fiction starring Goofy and uh, Mickey Mouse? I can totally imagine that. <laughs> I'm no sure one. somebody's written that one too. Pounder with cheese in France, Mickey. <laughs> what? <laughs> Boy, ale with cheese, Mickey. Yeah. <laughs> I can totally. See? So I, I, would, I would watch the hell out of that movie. Yes, I gladly saw, sacrifice that my, my progeny to you, a mighty Marvel beast. <laughs> <laughs> but Neil Adams is somewhere going, hmm? it's, it's my time. Uh, <laughs> How do you measure success? Hey, everyone. You're listening to Superhero Speak, and I'm your host, Dave. And I'm still sequestered. <laughs> oh, John, John, John. Uh, and as you notice, boys and girls, JD is not here with us this week. He had uh, family business to attend to. <laughs> family um, business. <laughs> they're crying out loud like 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 that's more important than us i mean seriously but taking his place we have a very special guest uh this week he is currently uh on the hit netflix series lock and key hmm. uh he plays oh um uh oh shoot sorry jesse no he is yeah. jesse I know he is just me. He plays Doug Brazell on Lock and Key. Sorry about that. Mm. Uh, he is, of course, the one and only Jesse Camacho. How are you, sir? I'm very good, but you and I are now in a fight. How dare you forget Doug Brazell's name? <laughs> you're, you're off I to a sterling start here. In all honesty, I haven't finished the, the season yet. I've only watched the first couple episodes, so um, and I haven't gotten back to it, so... You know, it's a good thing you've told me because then I will keep the spoiler talk to as much of a minimum as I can. Oh, no, please don't like go go ahead and tell us what's happening in season two. No, <laughs> so, Snape, Snape kills Dumbledore. There you oh, go. Oh, so in episode nine. Damn it. I was really rooting for Dumbledore. I know. Right. <laughs> so so I, I mean, I, I guess we'll ask you uh, with all the craziness that's going on in the world right now. How are you making out? You know, you you hanging in there. Uh, yeah, so far so good. Thanks for asking. I actually, uh, I live in uh, Toronto, uh, Canada, so uh, I actually had uh, come back to Montreal to, you know, hang out with my parents for a bit when all this stuff went down. So they were just like, hey, you want to just hang out here? And I said, yeah, and now it's been about a, a month and a half, and I don't think they're too tired of me yet. So I'm just hanging here, laying low, going for walks. And uh, so far, you know, touch wood, everyone's been uh, safe and healthy uh, with my family and friends. So hopefully that uh, continues. And cool. is there like, um, I mean, I know that a lot of shows went on hiatus or, you know, stopped, uh, stopped, uh, shooting. Like, is that, I, are you seeing that? Cause you're in the business that, uh, a lot of shows are, are stopping production now or they, or have they started again or are they doing different things? Yeah. Um, as, as far as I'm aware, I think everything kind of stopped. Uh, I, I wasn't in the middle of anything when this all kind of uh, went down, but, a couple of my friends were, and for all that I've heard, everything stopped and everything is on hold. I do think there are some things that are cautiously starting to plan to uh, get back at it. But the thing with film sets is they're kind of a, a big beast to wrangle because there's usually, you know, at least 100 people uh, in a pretty small area. So I think that uh, there's going to be some time while they kind of perfect how that's all going to work. I'm not exactly sure what the deal is, but uh, for the most part, everything's pretty dead right now. There's some stuff casting, but I don't think there's anything shooting right now, but I could be wrong. Okay. Huh. So so a question that we normally like to start off on, uh, is acting something you always wanted to do? Yeah, uh, it's funny. I kind of came out of the womb wanting to do it. Both my parents are actors. Mm -hmm. um, my, uh, my father, funnily enough, uh, played uh, President Nixon in X-Men Days of Future Past. Uh, if you guys have seen that movie, that's my yeah. uh, that's my dad. Um, nice. So, yeah, so my parents are both actors, and I kind of came out just 
wanting to to jump in and do it too and they were like are you sure there's a lot of you know a lot of rejection a lot of negativity um so they were they you know they were a little cautious but once i really said no this is what i want to do i was all of eight years old at the time they're like all right well let's give it a shot and they've been amazing super supportive uh, ever since then and my sister's an actress as well so yeah it's just i guess it just runs in the family so so at eight years old uh did you run out and get a commercial or something right away or did you go to well, school is, for it yeah that's a you know it's a good question too again i'm i'm sort of a i guess a, i'm in a special case i was super lucky because my parents were both uh in the industry i was able to get my foot in the door a little you know easier than someone who's coming at it with with no knowledge of it so i was like really really blessed in that way um i did go to a program in Montreal. It's literally called DTF. That is not a joke. That's what it was called, <laughs> DTF. It stood for Dynamic Theater Factory. It was a wonderful place, but <laughs> it has a different connotation today. Uh, and uh, yeah, then I was I was really lucky. I, I managed to to book a couple jobs, and it just kind of uh, kept kept growing from there. But uh, I do uh, classes here and there, but I, I've never really studied. I've never really gone to uh, like any particular school or program. I've just done kind of class here and there. Okay. Um, well, you've done you've done so much. It's kind of like you're a road scholar in this. Well, know? thanks. Yeah, I'm I, I'm super lucky, and I you know I, I used to go visit my mom and dad on sets and stuff, so I kind of grew up in, in that environment. Uh, and I, yeah, it was kind of you know trial by fire, but you know if uh, if, if acting is fire, then you know light me up because I, I really just enjoy it. <laughs> like like what's the best kind of advice they ever gave you? Uh you know, it was keep your head down. If you know you're doing, you know, good auditions and you feel like you're you're putting the you're putting the bat on the ball, then just just keep going. Don't let it get to you, you know, because you know if you get 20 auditions, most of the time you're not going to get 20 of them. Like it's that's just how it is. So they were like, you know, keep your head down, keep going, uh, you know, take it on the chin. If there's valuable criticism in there, absolutely, but. Uh, you know, just keep doing good work and eventually good things will come. You know, it's, it's just kind of how it works. And for some people, you know, you see amazing young actors that the first audition they get, it works out for them. And then there's guys or women that are in it for 40 years before they get their break. So it's just kind of stay with it, you know, keep, keep the confidence, keep the hope alive and just keep going. So, oh, very cool. So, yeah. so according to IMDb, and I know they're not always the greatest source. Um, yeah. But one of the things I saw in here, I was shocked, and I want to ask about. Uh, you did a voice for the cartoon Arthur. Okay, yes, this is true. But okay. cooler than that, actually, is uh, m- my father plays uh, Oliver Fransky, Francine's dad, the garbage man. That's my ah. father. Um, my mom's done voices on Arthur as well. Uh, I played D.W.'s boyfriend for a couple episodes. <laughs> It was I was I was quite young at the time, but yeah, Mon- uh, Arthur was big in Montreal, uh, obviously where I grew up, and a lot of the local, you know, uh, Montreal actors have done uh, great, huge parts on Arthur. Arthur's a great show. Oh yeah, my my uh, my granddaughters actually both love it. So, um, yeah, that's that's one of the reasons I wanted to ask about it. Um, so, and that's and and that was also getting me to my next question is I've noticed you've done voice. Uh, acting, video game, uh, some some mm-hmm. video game voices, and then on camera. Do you have a preference of the of those? Um, well, I, I obviously enjoy both. But yeah, I like doing on camera stuff. I just like that environment on set. You know, I, I like uh, I always say I really like teamwork. I love ensembles. I that's really the environment I feel like I thrive in. Uh, I feel like you know uh, I consider myself a good team player. But voice is super fun too. Just a lot of the time in, in voice work, you're kind of alone in the booth. There are, of course, exceptions. Uh, but uh, cartoons are super fun, though. You get to kind of just roll up in your sweatpants and uh, not care what you look like and record all day and, you know, <laughs> go home. And that's, you know, you, I'm, you're never going to hear me complain about that. But, you know, gun to my head, I just – there's something about, you know, being on set and on in cool sets and working with people that you really admire um, that is just super special to me. And, and, again, you do get that in voice, but, like – I don't know. I just, I just really love that onset environment. There's a certain excitement that comes with it. Okay. So can I ask how uh, the role in Lock and Key came about? Yeah, for sure. So uh, it was a pretty standard audition. Lock and Key, I think it's, uh, I don't know how uh, much reported it's been. It has had kind of a rocky road to the screen. Uh, 
there was a Fox pilot many years ago that didn't mm-hmm. end up going. And then there was a Hulu pilot that shot in Toronto a year before our pilot. And I actually auditioned for that for the role of Rufus, which <laughs> for those of you who've seen the show ended up going to a Kobe who's phenomenal. And I obviously didn't get that. And then, yeah, about a year later, I, I got the email from my agent for this guy, uh, for this guy, Roll Doug Brazell. And I said, hey, isn't this thing done? And she's like, nope, they're redoing it. And I went in and I, I had fun. It was a great casting uh, director there named Millie Tom. And I just, yeah, had fun with it. And I went home and I felt pretty good about it. And funnily enough, I was watching the show Lost, which is like, which was my religion when I was in high school. I was, I'm rewatching it for maybe the 18th time when I got the call that I booked the job. And it's the same creator, Carlton Cuse does, does Lock and Key and he did Lost as well. So, uh, that was kind of like, uh, like fate. It was crazy. But uh, yeah, that was sort of the backstory of that. Is uh, Doug was the only role I read for in the new uh, version of it, but I had read for another role in the Hulu pilot. All right, I'm going to ask you the question. I'm wow. sure you get in all of your interviews. <laughs> uh, did you read the books uh, before you uh, did the move? Did the show? I, I had known about them, uh, and especially when I read for the Hulu pilot, I did a bit of research before I went into it. But I only read them after I got cast, and I read them in literally like a day. It's just so up my alley. It's so my kind of thing. Uh, and what was really cool, too, is the Savini squad, the group that my character is involved with, mm-hmm. are not in the comics. So there was kind of like I got to read the comics, and then I thought I knew everything that was going to happen. I was like, well, my character's not there, so there's still stuff for me to discover uh, in the show. And, of course, the show does go off course a couple times as well from the books. But, yeah, by the time I got to set, I'd read them, yes. I, yeah, I'd, re- I'd read that um... – the now I haven't read the books yet, but I'd read that they had toned the show down just a bit. Yeah. Um, for Netflix and and did stuff like the town is now called Matheson instead of Lovecraft and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, I think that was actually uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think that was a request from Joe Hill himself, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, but yeah, they definitely made it more, uh, you know, I think for for a broader audience um, and. Yeah, I, uh, I, I really responded to that. I'm a big, like, Stranger Things guy as well. Mm. Uh, and the graphic novels, first of all, are absolutely incredible, uh, just as they are. But I think adapting them, like, exactly would have been fun for an episode or two, but then it would have been like, God, this is so dark. Yeah. I don't know if I could watch eight more episodes of these kids getting brutalized like this, but in graphic novel form, I mean, it's, it's genius. Well, you know, if it's Katniss Everdeen, fine. But you know, if you got, I mean, <laughs> it's like, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we've had dark before, but like, I, th- I think part of the, this goes into, um, oh, what do they call that? Like the body disformation stuff, where, um, I forget, I forget what, uh, what they call torture, it on torture porn kind of, yeah. area. maybe not exactly like that, but yeah. Kind of like that, like Cronen, Cronenberg, like, because, right. oh, I see what you're saying, yes. Yeah, because like, I mean, you've got keys that you're inserting into people and manipulating them like that. And it, it does like, it hits something kind of primal about, about, you know, some kind of primal fear that somebody could actually do that to you. That yeah, easily. messes with your head for sure. So you, you, um, of course you brought up Joe Hill, um, famously is yeah. actually, uh, Joseph, king uh mm-hmm. stephen king's son and mm-hmm. uh, and he famously has said that he wanted to write under the name joe hill because he didn't want to be judged by his father's works mm-hmm. um with, with his writing so knowing that both your parents are actors uh did that influence did that thought cross your head when you started going into acting that's a great question i never really uh thought about it i mean i guess at the time i was super young so uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm so ignorant to the world of, uh, of writing, but, you know, Stephen King is such a giant. I mean, he's probably the most famous author in the world. I mean, you've got, you know, like your J.K. Rowling and people like that, but I really feel like, you know, everyone knows Stephen King. So even though I think Joe Hill obviously changed his name and his work was maybe discovered by the average person, uh, as if, you know, on it completely his own merit, but I'm sure getting things published, it certainly, it, it certainly helped him behind closed doors. Uh, d- please don't come at me, Joe. I don't know the story. <laughs> uh, but, you know, as, as an actor, you know, it's kind of a weird industry where you almost want to, you want every advantage you can get, especially at the beginning, just to get in, just to get in the door. So, 
you know, I was super happy to, uh, you know, uh, to go into cat with cats and directors that knew my parents very well. Um, you know, it didn't necessarily get me a job, but it got me an opportunity to show what I can do. So, yeah, I mean, it never, really, especially in outside too of Canada, um, you know, uh, I think people will really know me for me in Canada. My parents, uh, especially my, uh, my dad are, are fairly well known, uh, up here. So, uh, I, I, it never, no, it never bugged me. And plus him and I look so much alike when you're on screen, it would be hard to, hard to hide that fact. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, so another, so staying with Lock and Key a little bit, um, mm-hmm. of course, uh, Doug is kind of, for lack of a better term, he's kind of a nerd. Um, oh, for sure. Um, do you think of yourself that way? And does that influence the kind of roles that you go after or the kind of roles that maybe you get offered? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I definitely consider myself a nerd. In fact, Doug and I are, are very similar. I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm maybe not as sarcastic and condescending as he can be sometimes, <laughs> but that's, hmm. that's more of a, I think that's a bit of a shield for his own insecurities more than anything else. Um, but yeah, I definitely consider myself a nerd and it's definitely in, you know, the wheelhouse of stuff that I find myself reading for a lot is like, you know, the, the best friend, the, the computer nerd, you know, on a rare occasion, I'll be seen for something against type. Which is always super fun, but you know, getting into getting into Doug's skin is really not that hard for me. I mean, I adore horror films. You know, I'd seen a bunch of Tom Savini's films, so it really wasn't too much of a stretch for me. In fact, like I remember when I got those sides, I was like, okay, this is there, there's certain things that you get. I think where the actors like, okay, I got to put a lot of work into this. I got to, you know, really work to get it. And these were this was the time where I got the script. I was like, okay, I know what this is. I think I understand it. Uh, I don't need to look at it too much. I just need to go in and put as much of me in it as I can to make it the most natural I can. And it really is a, a lot of me out there. Again, I think that I'm uh, sometimes a more pleasant person to be around than Doug, but uh, other than that, we're very similar. And yeah, that is the wheelhouse that I like to play in. Cool. Cool. So, um, yeah, because I also noticed, oh. too, that uh, you were a uh, onlooker, I think is is the credit, in mm-hmm. Kick-Ass 2. Yes. <laughs> Now, was that something yeah. that you wanted to do or just kind of fell in your lap or? Yeah, that, no, that fell into my lap. And unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not quite, uh, I'm not really at the place yet where, you know, I, I get to pick and choose my own work. Obviously, that's mm-hmm. every actor's goal. I'm still in the, you know, beggars can't be choosers category right now, <laughs> uh, which is why, you know, I'm so fortunate to have something like lock and key that I, you know, would choose if I had the option, but you no know, kick ass too as well. No, that was, I was coming off of, uh, a fun show that I did up in Canada called Less Than Kind. And, uh, yeah, my agent just said, you know, there's a, like a small role in Kick-Ass 2. Do you want to read for it? Uh, and I was like, a hundred percent. Absolutely. Yes. What do I have to do? Uh, yeah, I, I went in and, uh, the great cast and director in Toronto, another one named uh, Jason Knight saw me. And yeah, I got to go in and, and do a day on that. And that was, you know, that was kind of walking into, your childhood fantasy being on that set. I mean, I wasn't, obviously I wasn't there very, very long, but it was so much fun. Cool. And, uh, so actually too, we had, we had talked in the beginning about how things are kind of on hold with a lot of stuff. And right. you said how happy you are to have, you know, gotten a role like Doug in, you know, a big property like, uh, lock and key and, um, it's been watched by a lot of people at this point. So it starts getting your face out there more, your name. Does it, does, and I don't know anything about the behind the scenes and acting. So I'm, I'm asking this in all sincerity. Right. Does this now pandemic slow the momentum that lock and key may have given you? Yeah. I, I feel like there's, there's a couple ways to look at it. I mean, obviously, you know, so low on the list of, terrible things that this has brought upon, but it's definitely a drag. Uh, don't quote me on this because I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I believe that we would have been starting season two around now. Mm-hmm. And because of what's going on, you know, we're kind of pushed. I'm not exactly sure when we're going. I've heard the fall, but again, I, I could be very wrong. So it is a drag because I, I you know, I, I just want to get back out there and, you know, have more fun and do the show. But the flip side of it is, you know, 
uh, people, more people are checking out Netflix. So I was going to say, I think it's actually, yeah, it's actually giving the show more of an opportunity to be seen. So it, you know, if that's a, again, really not the priority right now, but if that's a small silver lining for the show, then, you know, that's, that's great. You literally have a captive audience. <laughs> exactly. There's, you know, it's, uh, what it, what are you going to do? No, like get the TV's right there. Just throw it on. Just put it on, you know? Check us out. Check out Outer Banks, Ozark, all the, all that stuff on Netflix or any streaming service. Well, and, and Lock and Key has gotten a lot of buzz. I mean, a lot of people seem to like it. Mostly because, yeah. you know, it is kind of a darker series and, um, and it's very different from, you know, all the other stuff out there that's ready for binging at this point. Uh, so. So actually, I just looked it up. Um, yeah, so they in March they just confirmed season two, and mm. uh, there are, there are no release dates or anything at this point. They're saying earliest would probably be spring of next year. So, um, yeah, and I'm sure that 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 could change. It'll be earlier. It'll be later. I'm sure that's just kind of what they're saying right now. <laughs> but that, again, I, I don't really know much more than that. So so is that exclusive uh, news here that that Doug is returning for season two? Uh, you know, you might see him again. I, to be honest, I don't know for sure. Uh, uh, from, uh, <laughs> you're from, hoping. Well, uh, well you know, unless he turns into a demon. I feel pretty confident when, when I was at the, you know, exactly, you know, uh, watch episode six. You never know what will happen. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, from, you know, the, the whispers that I've heard and, you know, I, I have, I went, when I was at, sorry, I'm scrambling, but when I was in L.A. for the premiere, uh, Meredith and Carlton were kind enough to invite me to the writer's room. And, uh, we went and they didn't tell me anything. They were very tight lipped, but, you know, they were, uh, pretty kind enough to kind of let me know that it sounds like the squad will be back and up to more shenanigans. But what those are, I actually really don't know. So I'm, yeah. I'm super excited. I mean, anything can change from now until then, but as far as I know, you will see Doug again. Yeah. I haven't read the books yet, but I'm hoping that you, t- it turns out that you're the puppet master behind everything. Um, that would make, <laughs> that would make I'm the in, character I'm very in. interesting. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you've been, you've been in quite, uh, you've been in quite a lot, but there's, there's a few other series that you've been in a little bit, like, um, and you can tell me if it's wrong, cause again, I'm pulling this off of, uh, yeah, IMDb, please. but This Life, Night Owl, Insomnia, um, I mean, how, how was working on those? I mean, did you, did you like, uh, working oh. what, or what was your favorite? And, you know, I think that the, you know, besides lock and key, which I would say now having done it is, yeah. it's tough to call the, the, between the, between lock and key and the one I'm about to mention, but lock and key, I would say now it's probably, if not the highlight, it's, it's tied. Uh, I did a show called, uh, less than kind, which we shot up in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, actually. And, uh, that was very much the, the experience that I think shaped me the most as an actor and uh, as a person, it was uh, the show that kind of came along. It was based on this guy, Marvin Kaye's life about this, you know, very kind of overweight kid stuck in this crazy family. And, you know, the, 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 I, I got the breakdown for the audition and the lead guy was someone like myself. And I'm a, I'm a big guy. And I'm not used to kind of seeing that, especially at the time as the center of a show. And I remember going, oh, my God, this is me. Like, I get this. And, you know, I'm not usually the guy that's the center of anything. Like, this is really cool. And I was lucky enough to book that job and be on this show with these amazing people for four seasons that stretched over five years. We kind of had more lives than a cat on that show. The fact that we survived to season four with everything that production went through is uh, very surprising. But, yeah, that's still probably the project nearest and dearest to me. But in terms of, like, stuff that I look at where I would just be a massive fan of, it's definitely lock and key. Uh, Insomnia was a fun one, too. I actually shot that out in uh, Moscow, Russia, which was uh, a really oh. fun and different experience. Yeah, that's definitely the furthest I've gone for work. Uh, and that was really fun. That's a kind of a dark, Hunger Games-y-ish kind of show. Um, so, yeah, I, I've been super lucky, man, for sure. There's no question. Uh, I'm just so grateful for, the, for those opportunities. But, yeah, if you tell me which show the ones that really meant the most to me. It was... Definitely less than kind and lock and key. So, um, so as a as a as a person that uh, um, is a nerd and grew up also with a, a weight issue, um, how important is it that those kind of things be presented in a positive light? 
You know, uh, that's, that's, that's a really good point. I'm actually uh, right now with one of the creators of Left and Kind, I've been developing a show in the kind of uh, format of a Masters of None. And, and what I mean by that is it kind of a point of view show, a perspective show. Mm-hmm. And this one just so happens to be, it is based on me. It's about an actor who's, you know, uh, you know, clinically morbidly obese and how that affects kind of all the aspects of his life from his confidence to his you know, uh, journey as an actor to his love life, his dating life. And for me, it's it, like seeing it in a good light obviously is, is super important to me and something I really care about. But it's also for me just seeing the whole picture. You know, I feel like I, this is, I kind of say this in the breakdown for the show that I'm pitching, which is called uh, Heavy. Uh, you know, I, I want to see the Chris Farley and the Jack Candy, that fit that great physical comedy you know, where the guy falls down and embarrasses himself and it's hilarious. But then I want to see the moment where he goes home and he closes the door and he's mortified and he's embarrassed and he binge eats, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, it what's, what's imp- as important to me as showing it in a good light is just showing kind of the whole picture, the, you know, uh, forgive the term underbelly mm-hmm. uh, of the whole thing. Uh, so, yeah, that's something that's important to me. And that's why, like, I was so thrilled with something like Less Than Kind or even lock and key, even from a peripheral stance, having that representation on screen, you know, it, it does, it is, I think, lower on the list of getting diverse voices out there. I think that's obviously something that's, that's more important, but these other issues that aren't, you know, drug or alcohol related necessarily, giving them a presence too. Like I, I uh, the great Canadian actor, his name escapes me right now, who's going to be the next uh, big Marvel superhero. What's his name? Um, Anyway, he was he tweeted at Marvel, "How about you know uh, an Asian superhero?" And then a year later, that's just, that was just a joke he put out. He's now the next big Marvel superhero. And when I wrote that, I literally went on Twitter. I was like, "Hey, Marvel, how about a fat superhero? I'm ready." You know, <laughs> just to may as well put it out there. So yeah, it does it does mean it does mean a lot to me as long as it's done in a way that shows the full picture. This is a really long answer for for that simple thing. Hey, I'm. Actually, I wanted to say something on this because, uh, again, um, I also had a weight problem when I was young. Uh, still kind of do, but, um, the thing is that, uh, I noticed, I noticed something like there's more representation in shows these days and not, like you said, the Chris Farley part where it's there for people to laugh at. And like, uh, and, and so, like, uh, last year they came out with a show called Emergence. And for once, the main character wasn't the, you know, underwear model type. Right. And, and it was, yeah, what Allison, uh, Tolman, um, plays mm-hmm. the lead, uh, Joe yeah. Evans. And she's great. Yeah. And she's I'm, and it was nice to see a character that you could really like that wasn't there just because they look good. Um, you know, even though she looks great, she just, you know, she's not like the underwear model like they normally put up there, you know, regardless of, of talent. And she's really, really good. And I'm glad to see that kind of representation starting to go out, you know, to show pe- people that it, you know, doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter anymore. All right. Yeah, I feel like I feel like you see it a lot in uh, in you don't really see it on the, you know, the ABCs, the Fox, the CBS is still great networks. You see it. I find more in like streaming things and other kind of cable shows so something like emergence is an amazing thing i agree and and that's on abc yeah so. exactly that's what i mean like you, that's that's yeah. really the networks where you don't usually see it like yeah so i totally agree with you it, it is really great to see so i'm gonna i'm gonna butcher this but sumao lao yes i think that yes that's yeah that's that's he, name, he'll yeah. Be, yeah he'll be playing uh shang chi the master of kung fu so so just just so just to get it in there because because you exactly mentioned <laughs> Yeah, he's awesome. Fellow Canadian. He's he was on a, that great Canadian. He's on a great Canadian sitcom called uh, Kim's Convenience. And then all of a sudden, I read one morning that his life has changed forever. He sat. He's a. I, I I met him super briefly once at a party in Canada. A super nice guy, who you know works his ass off. So I'm I'm thrilled for him. That's awesome. Yeah, and and I do. Th- you hear that a lot when these people get cast in these Marvel movies as well. It's just right away it's uh doors open up you're getting mm-hmm. interviewed you're you're being swept off your feet um i guess <laughs> yeah. 
I you've, got, if, you've got ninjas following you. With well, that's true too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wonder if it gets if it's hard for that to not get to your head, though. You know, I, I mean, I, I I don't I wouldn't really know from I guess personal experience. You know, I've been lucky with that lock and key has had the reception it has. But I mean, for myself, uh, it's been super cool, and like I'm, I'm not underplaying it in any way. But you know, my life hasn't drastically changed. Uh, I can report back to you see how the leads of Lock and Key are doing after season two, but I'm sure that they're still uh, wonderful people. But yeah, something life altering like that, like booking a Marvel film. Um, you know, I, I worked with uh, a guy years ago on a Disney movie, um, Noah Centineo, who's now pretty massive. He was in um, that those Netflix movies to All the Boys I've Loved Before and all that mm-hmm. stuff, and he went from having like I don't know 50,000 followers on Instagram to like you know, 20 million overnight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't really keep in contact with him much anymore, but uh, I have friends that do. And, you know, I was thrilled to hear that like it hasn't phased him one bit, but I can totally see someone, you know, I can see how that gets to your head in a certain way. You know, all of a sudden you're getting everything handed to you on a silver platter. Like, you know, I I, I could see the, the temptation to go there. It's kind of a double-edged sword, though, these days, isn't it? Because, like, no matter how good a person you are, no matter what you put out there on social media, there's always going to be people out there that go after you for no reason other than the lols. Like, they, yeah. they're they just they're just doing it because they like trolling. Like, yeah, it, it's true. I mean, you know, uh, I think I think social media in general uh, is a bit of a double-edged sword. I really do like the fact that it lets us, you know, express ourselves and, you know, you can communicate with people that you would never meet. But as you say, there's that flip side to that where some people have whatever's bothering them in their personal life and they take it out on someone online. And as you know, anything that you say can be misconstrued. So it's, it is, it yeah. is a strange time. Yeah. Well, I mean, you also said you don't have personal experience. I mean, after your father got cast in um, an X-Men, X-Men movie, did that go to his head? <laughs> uh, it didn't. It didn't. But I think that's because he's he's got a lot of prosthetics on in that movie, so no yeah. one, uh, not a lot of people recognized him. But uh, but I, I got to go visit set one day, and uh, and that oh. was overwhelmingly cool. I was sitting with uh, my dad because he was. It's just you know, there's obviously there's hierarchies on set, uh, especially projects like that where you've got massive celebrities, uh, so they you know usually get their own uh, kind of section. And uh, for whatever reason, maybe because he was playing Nixon, they kind of put my dad with them. So while he was off and shooting something, I was sitting in his cash chair. It was like me, Jennifer Lawrence, James McAvoy, Michael Fassbender, Peter Dinklage. Oh. And I was just sitting there, and they're all just like, you know, chatting on their phones and reading. And I was just kind of sitting there quietly going, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that experience didn't change you in any way. No. Well, I mean, it, it didn't change me. I, I if, if anything, I went, I went, I've got a long way to go. <laughs> um, but that was. But really you cool. and Peter Dinklage are just like that now. <laughs> you know what's, uh, you know what's funny is um, uh, after that, uh, after that day, um, my dad and myself, uh, and we all went for a drink with some of the Montreal people, and uh, I'm not going to say Peter because we really aren't on a first name basis. We were maybe for that day, but Peter Dinklage <laughs> came with us. And uh, while we were sitting there, my the show that I was on, Less Than Kind, that I mentioned before, was actually on HBO Canada, and it led into Game of Thrones in Canada for, oh, nice. I don't know, two seasons. Yeah, uh, and uh, we were sitting there, and some guy kind of came up and, uh, you know, recognized Peter Dinklage and was, like, talking to him for a bit, and uh, he looked up, as he was believe, and he looked at me, and he went, Oh my god, and you're on that show before him. (laughs) You guys hang out all the time? And I was like, all the time. (laughs) We shared a laugh, and that was, that was really cool, because I I don't even think I told him I was an actor, because I was, you know, uh, and also, yeah, again, this was while Game of Thrones was on, and, uh, I, I liked Game of Thrones. I don't know what, if you guys have had discussions about the ending, I, you know, I enjoy the show. Yeah. Uh, Especially at the time, I think it was just after, I think it was between seasons three and four. So it was when the show was like really, really hot. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a pinch me moment and he was such a nice guy. He's the coolest dude. Hey everyone, I really hope you're enjoying our interview with Jesse here. But 
I wanted to take a moment and give everyone an update on our Nerd Madness competition. So when we left it off, we were in the middle of round two of this tournament this year. Starting off, of course, we had John Wick versus Spider-Man Far From Home for movies. The final tally on that is John Wick took it with 53.4% of the vote to Spider-Man Far From Home getting 46.6%. So that was a close one, but John Wick took it. And of course, we also had our TV matchup, which was The Witcher versus The Boys. The Boys took it with 59% to The Witcher's 41%. So chalk one up for random violence. Then, then moving on to comics, we had Batman Damned from DC versus Conan the Barbarian from Marvel. And Batman Damned took it at 60.6% to Conan's 39.4%. So uh, I guess, again, chalk one up for... Bat Penis. And finally, for our second anime round, we had Castlevania vs. Darwin's Gate. And to a surprise of no one, Castlevania took this at 91.7% to Darwin's Game 8.3%. So what does that mean for round three, our final individual rounds? Well, that means that we will end up with John Wick versus Endgame for movies. We will also then get Mandalorian versus The Boys for TV. Round three of anime is going to be Demon Slayer versus Castlevania. And last but not least, in comics, we will get House of X versus Batman Dan. So they should be some really good matchups at the end here, and we will see who final takes the final. Of course, once we figure out who wins all four categories, they will take each other on head-to-head, and one winner will be declared. So keep an eye out for those matchups coming up this week, and vote for your favorites. And you know what? Here's D Square to tell you how you can follow along. Enjoying the show? Want to be part of Social Media Madness? Make sure you are following SuperheroSpeak.com, where you can find all of the show's social media links at the top of the page. While you're there, you can check out old episodes of the podcast, as well as some other great content. Check the site often, because we are posting some great comic reviews, as well as comic book and movie news content every day. Make sure and follow us on Twitter, at SuperheroSpeak. And while you're there, check out the rest of the Geek World All-Stars Podcast Network. You can follow them at stars underscore geek. The Geek World All-Star Podcast Network include great programs such as the Pop Prison Power Podcast, Cult 45, So Wizard, Fans on Patrol, the Gorilla Brain Podcast, and of course, Superhero Speak. Search for hashtag GWAllStars. You will not be disappointed. Now, it's back to Dave and the boys on Superhero Speak. Thank you, Don. So, all right. Before we get back to our good friend Jesse, uh, we are going to do a little housekeeping in the sense of paying the bills. So, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we'll get right back to the conversation with Jesse. So what did you think of the ending? Um, I actually, so I don't know if this is a hot take or not. Um, I well, just remember no the more contra- just remember the more controversial you say it, the more people you might get on your Twitter. It's not true. <laughs> um, I, I, I honestly, with the exception of maybe Jay, Jamie, I had no issue with most of how the arcs ended. Like, I could see it, you know, I was like, I was like, yeah, okay, Daenerys goes crazy, like, is that what I wanted to happen? No. But I was like, all right, like, I, I get it. I just felt, and I think a lot of people agree with this, I was like, I just wish, give them four or five more episodes. I was like, I, it just felt very truncated to me, uh, and, and to me, that, that, was, that was such a drag, because I feel like that moment in, uh, I think the episode's called The Bells, right? Where she turns and she kills everyone in the city. 
Yeah. It was it was shocking, especially because it was so fast, even though I kind of was like, well, this is obviously where this is going. She's going to go crazy. But it, instead of it feeling like a sad, tragic, like, oh, you know, it, it felt more rushed and shocking, if if that makes any sense. Uh, and, and I just wish that they'd, they'd had more of a chance to earn that payoff. Uh, and I know the writers were like, oh, we only need six. I think if the last two seasons were 10, I think there's less of a problem with it today. Uh, and the Jamie Lannister ending, I don't know. I just like, I'm a sucker for redemption arcs. I don't know what yeah. it is. I love them. I can never get enough of them. You give me the worst villain on a TV show, not in real life, obviously, hmm. on a TV show. And doesn't matter almost what they've done in the terms of television and fiction. Please don't at me. Uh, and you start to redeem them. I really like it. Like, again, I reference Lost a lot. My favorite character on that show was a character named Sawyer who was like this huge dick and ended up being, you know, in the end, the, the almost one of the major heroes of the show. So I really liked that. So I was really warming to Jamie and then it kind of felt like they were like, Oh, we don't have enough time to totally redeem him. So let's just scrap it. And, yeah. uh, and you know, have him say, I never really cared about the people of King's Landing. And, you know, have him go back. I, it made sense. It made sense that he'd go back to Cersei in a way. I don't know. It, that that was the one that disappointed me the most. Otherwise, I was like, yeah, okay. To me, it was a lot of it was correct, but it was in point form rather than like a story. Yeah, the, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. If there were a few more episodes, like second and third season, they might have been able to make it so that people understood Mm-hmm. Her split personality turn or yes. her, her, you know, switch being flipped. But, uh, you know, then again, we still haven't gotten the last book. So True. he might, he might take that and, and that's the problem. Like the writers for the show wrote the ending for this, which may or may not be even close to the real ending. Well, so, yeah. I mean, to, to be fair, that he did, um, Martin did put down what he wanted for the ending he of the show. He told them some stuff, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> he, he was trial ballooning it, so let, let them have it, exactly. and if it doesn't work, I'll... <laughs> but, I mean, I know, like, even if, if he writes the books and the ending is completely different, and he swears that that was his plan all along, that was like, no, this was always the book ending, part of me's going to be like, I don't think so. I think you changed <laughs> it, because people lost right. their shit when, they, when the show ended. But I think, no, I, because I think you're right, like, the way the character stories end it felt okay but Mm -hmm. the fact that it turned so quickly because they didn't stretch it out enough and i think that's where the problem is like i think he said here's how i want all the character stories to end and you guys figure out the path there um yeah yeah i mean when uh when um oh i can't think of her name the queen of dragons yeah in that episode daenerys Daenerys, Mm -hmm. yes when she she's like you know, torches everyone. It's like, it's, it feels like it is, like you said, more just for shock value than actually like, no, this well, is yeah, the turn the, of the, the character. Whole, the, whole, the whole show, she's been like, I'm freeing the slaves and trying mm-hmm. to be a good person and showing you what these, what these leaders are supposed to be doing. And then in the end, she just turns around and goes, nah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah like, I remember the, the, the previously where they like, the, I don't, I don't know if they did it at the time, but I just remember the, the beginning of that episode, they were doing a kind of scenes from last week or, you know, whatever. And I remember them really emphasizing all these quotes of like, oh, when a Targaryen is born, they say you flip a coin. And I was like, wow, this like previously on Game of Thrones is doing a lot of work right now to try to justify, I think, what we're about to see in this episode mm-hmm. um, that, you know, maybe the show itself hadn't done. And again, like, I don't like, I think those guys that created the show overall are brilliant. I think the first, you know, bunch of seasons of Game of Thrones are as good as you can get. So I don't really like, you know, and it's hard to end anything, but I just, I, I agree. I think what happened was they didn't have the books. They kind of had an outline and maybe in their heart of hearts, it didn't even make sense to them. So they were like, how can we in six episodes or, you know, seven and then six for the last two justify this as much as we can i don't know again i can't speak for them but maybe their hearts weren't really in it too there's there there's that as well there's a lot at play there definitely no that's true um so 
so back to you. <laughs> See? Ah. Uh, so, so, okay. I, I have to ask this, um, because mm-hmm. I don't see you listed as a voice for this, and I'm, uh, it's curious, again, on IMDb, mm-hmm. Assassin's Creed Origins. You have a special thank you in the credits? Yeah, I think, um, so what they do a lot of the times at, uh, Ubisoft in Montreal is they take a face scan of you that they use as, you know, potential, you know, uh, starting points for future design. And I believe I did one, uh, for Ubisoft and I think that they, you know, they used it in a couple games and that's the one they gave me the shout out for. But I, I haven't done much more. I didn't really do work on, on any of the Assassin's games. My, my dad's done kind of some voice stuff for them and I have buddies that have, but yeah, I think they just took my face. To have me some villager that gets slaughtered or something. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Which I'll always do, nice. by the way. It's awesome. I'm not complaining. Oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, it's because it, it looked odd to me because you're not listed as a voice or or anything else for the game, just a special thank you, so. Yeah, usually that's reserved for, like, someone sort of important, like the writer's, like, therapist that inspired them and gave them this huge breakthrough but now nah, they just took my my face and stuck me in the back i think <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's exciting and humbling at the same time it honestly no it was it was it was all exciting i'm just I, and that's even a guess like i'm not even sure that that's what it was because i don't think i did i don't think i did they call it barks which is you just go in and you do like screams and stab sounds i don't even think i did uh, background voices for it or anything. I, I really just do. So, so I'm guessing, but hey, if, if they want to give me a special thanks or use me in any way, I am, they, they can, whatever. I'm, I'm game. How about you would be the model for the next, uh, Assassin's Creed, the, the main character? I think that the sales would uh, plummet, but I would be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> I would be ecstatic and, uh, I would, uh, you know, burn all the, the bad reviews and the fans going, this makes no sense. And I would say, who cares? This is amazing. Hmm. All right. So besides a, a future Assassin's Creed, uh, game, you have any mm-hmm. other projects, uh, coming out? Um, well, as I said, I'm kind of pitching that show, uh, mm-hmm. that I'm working with my buddy Chris. Uh, I did a web series. I think it's, I'm not sure if it's listed as completed on IMDb called the uh, Night Owl, which was super fun. It was kind of a, um, semi improvised, semi scripted, uh, thing that I shot with uh, my buddy Rebecca Michigan, who's a really, really talented actress writer. And uh, especially with everyone kind of being stuck at home right now, I know she's trying to really speed up that process and kind of just release it on whatever platform will take it. So that's a really fun one. Hopefully you can look out for that soon. And other than that, it's just uh, getting ready to hopefully have some more fun on uh, on season two. Yeah, definitely. Um, I can't wait to finish watching season one, and uh, but then I have yeah, to wait a whole year again, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, and and who knows now? Like that's the thing when my parents were big uh, Ozark fans. Here, we finished uh, season three of Ozark, and we're like, well, I guess we'll see the end of that in twenty twenty five. Hell, I haven't seen Ozark yet, but I've heard a lot about it. That's wonderful. It's so good. Yeah, <laughs> it's just really well done. Um, so as an actor, you, you we hear a lot going on right now, especially with movie theaters not being open, and um, obviously mm-hmm. a lot of people are watching stuff streaming, and they're talking about the future of movie theaters. Do you see things drastically changing after all of this with how people consume? Movies going forward? Uh, I, I definitely see the argument for it. I really hope not, man, in terms of movie theaters. Like, I remember, I mean, it, it's already changed so much from, you know, from stuff that I already enjoyed. I do love streaming platforms. I think they're super smart. And what they've done for the television landscape, I think, is pretty incredible. Um, but, you know, I when I was a kid and I was thinking about part-time jobs I would have because again I was in my mind I was always going to be an actor so it was like what job am I going to get to pay the bills I would also say oh well I'm going to work at Blockbuster it's just it's just done like it's the cool place to hang out on a Friday night and uh, and I'll just work there uh, and you know that that's gone and the thought of movie theaters going is just like heartbreaking I'm not concerned about the future of the industry necessarily I do think that there might be some short-term problems obviously some companies 
are going to have financial troubles and everything like that. I, but I think that, you know, as, as long as there's televisions and phones and any device to watch anything on, I think that it's pretty safe. But in terms of movie theaters, yeah, it's trouble, but it's like, to me, it's such a drag. Like I just, I just love that feeling. I love going to theater. I love watching stuff in theaters, especially big event films. Don't kill me, Scorsese. Just mm-hmm. like, hmm. you know, seeing uh, end game in theaters was incredible. Even, and then, and then I'll, I'll, I'll admit it, like seeing Irishman in theaters, I very much enjoyed more than when I watched it at home. Uh, and I, I like the last movie I saw in theaters before this all happened was Invisible Man, which I really loved uh, seeing in a theater atmosphere. You know, people say the big screen, but it's also the sound quality in those places. So I really, really hope uh, they find a way to bounce back. And I still think they will. But I'm being more and more convinced that theaters might be the next thing in not potential trouble, but like very, very real trouble. That would be a shame because it's the shared experience in a theater is unlike most anything else. And it's one of the few places where you still get together with a whole bunch of strangers with common interests, like regularly, you know? I totally agree. I mean, you just, uh, I think Marvel just released, and I've gone down YouTube rabbit holes of this, of movie theater reactions to whether it be, again, Marvel movies, you know, Star Wars, or I'm a, we're big Harry Potter fans in this house. Uh, those kind of things. I love watching movie theater reactions to that stuff. And you just, there's something about that vibe. Like every, you're right. You don't know anybody there, but you're all in on it together. It's almost like a roller coaster in a way. Not to, again, not to feed the amusement park, um, metaphor, <laughs> but there, there really is that kind of joint atmosphere that you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And I really don't want the last movie to, I see in the theater oh, to, no. to be Sonic the Hedgehog. So yeah, I mean they, they they've got to pull out of this. <laughs> Did you not like it? I didn't see it. It's not bad. No, it really isn't bad. My it, I was shocked. My 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 seventeen soon to be eighteen year old son was like, hey, I really want to go see this because he's a big gamer and he loves the Sonic right. games. So, um, and it wasn't bad. Jim Carrey actually is really good in it. But that's what I that's what I heard. Yeah. But but yeah no I mean I'm I'm a, that is the last movie you ever a, saw you want to be like what was the last thing you saw in theaters like Endgame <laughs> or some massive huge like Star Wars it's right like, what I'll, was it, it was, oh Sonic the Hedgehog it's like oh okay all right well, yeah, yeah Rise of Skywalker is even better than the Sonic <laughs> hey I I have a random question for you mm-hmm. uh, on your Twitter feed you've got a picture of you. Like nailed to a getting, tree. Is that me getting crucified? Yeah. Yeah. What? What is um, that? So that's from uh, a movie I did called Lost After Dark. Um, and uh, I'm a big slasher fan, as is again my character on Lock and Key. And uh, I I had a really fun role in this movie called Again Lost After Dark, which is almost it's it's. It's a bit of a parody, but it's a straight face parody. We kind of made this movie that was the original plan for it was supposed to be a lost, a found film. There's found footage and the director, Ian Kessner, wanted to do this found film. He wanted to do this big publicity thing where he goes, Oh my God, we found this lost movie from the set of the eighties called, uh, called House on the Hill two. And hmm. so we shot it big in secret and stuff, but then. You know, as post-production came along, it was, I think, a little too convoluted, so he just released it as Lost After Dark. But yeah, I get uh, I get crucified, and I just thought it was a funny shot, so I was like, well, that should be the first thing people see of me when they find me on Twitter. Oh, yeah, I, I can see how that works as an introduction. <laughs> exactly, right? It's a nice icebreaker. Um, so, you're, so you're a horror film fan. Um, yeah. What's, uh, what's one of your favorite horror movies? Um, I, I was really, really into the, uh, the paranormal activity. I really enjoyed. I liked the first Exorcist, but I think the one that this, the, the film series that's nearest and dearest to my heart with my friends would be the Scream franchise. We're massive Scream fans. My friend Alex Harouche, uh, every year on his birthday, we do a Screamathon where we watch all four and we drink at every couple things. And actually tomorrow night, we're doing a Zoom chat where me and my buddies, just for fun, we're going to read Scream 1, and we're all going to play different characters. So, we, uh, yeah, we're really, really partial to that. I'm 
I'm very I'm excited for this reboot they've announced. This is actually a bit of a funny story. I don't have this agent anymore. But uh, a few years back, they were coming out with the Scream TV show, which I didn't love, but I did watch it thoroughly. So I guess I did like it to some degree. Um, <laughs> and I emailed my agent saying, I don't care what we have to do. Uh, I really would love to read for this. And I got the most polite uh, <laughs> answer back that I completely agree with. They said, you know, Jesse, we sent them your demo. They, they really enjoyed your work. The issue is, is you don't make a great red herring because physically they would know it was you. <laughs> and I might have laughed for half an hour, and I literally wrote back, enough said, I totally agree. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's like, it's like, who do you guys think is Ghostface? Like, well, I mean, we're pretty sure it's Dave. And they just point to me and it's like, well, yeah, mystery solved. But, uh, yeah, anyway, long story short, uh, I think Scream is not really a horror friend. It's more of a slasher, but, uh, yeah, those like Paranormal Activity, The Exorcist. Uh, I really enjoy those. Cool. I mean, I, I, I like that you, um, have a have a couple older movies in there, um, it, you know, because I was I was trying to think as you were saying that because the first screen was 1996. Um, yes. So you would have been what four when it came out? Well, um, yeah, uh, I I I think I I saw it uh, I saw it when I was around 11, which is arguably still a little young. I'm not even mm-hmm. sure my parents I was that young. I think it was. One of those, you know, how old parties you have at that age where you, you pull an all-nighter with your friends because you think that's fun and healthy to do. No, we and, won't tell them. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you watch movies and we watch Scream. And yeah, I don't know. I just, I really love that screenplay. I actually really like the first two Scream movies a lot. And then the other two I still enjoy, but you know, they're, they're not, I don't think they're, they're, they're up there as much. Uh, but yeah, I think I probably saw it when I was eleven or twelve. Yeah, I was probably eleven when I first saw The Exorcist. And, and uh, how was that experience? Oh dear! Uh, it, it terrified me, you know, yeah. especially being raised Catholic, you know, oh, yeah. and 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 hearing about this kind of stuff at school and in in Catholic grade school. Um, not not so much, but you know, they talked about demons and whatnot. So you're like, oh my God, it's real and. And it mm-hmm. freaks you out. Um, I, I was scared of that movie for the longest time. Oh, I can uh, imagine. You, you guys are wussies. My first, my first one was um, when I was eleven. VCR. We've got our first VCR um, mm-hmm. machine, and the very first movie that my father bought so that we could watch it on there was John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, great movie. Oh yeah, especially when you're 11. Nightmares <laughs> for weeks. I can only imagine, and the practical effects in that are off the charts. So that oh. Might have made it even. Worse. Oh yeah. So obviously the very next, I mean, I had to have my palate cleansed, so we did Alien, <laughs> which is oh, just. Oh boy. <laughs> I was. I, that's amazing. Yeah, uh, it explains a lot. <laughs> I, I was, I was, I think 12 or 13. I was spending the night at my. Uh, one of my friends house and he was like oh i got a really great movie it was uh phantasm we had oh, we actually actually classic. ended up watching phantasm one and two that night and uh um i couldn't sleep lots <laughs> those movies are so silly though is when you get older and look back on them yeah they're, oh, they're sure. still weird. even even you know i although the exorcist is still pretty scary i watched it uh god a couple months back and there are parts of it that are maybe a little dated now, mm-hmm. um, but it's still like it's still pretty freaky, man. So, so here's a here's a question then, because you obviously are writing as well. If you were mm-hmm. going to write a horror movie, would you use a lot of the same tropes that are in most horror movies, or would you try to do something different? You no, know, I think that I would start out going, oh, I'm going to change everything and do something completely different, and then I'd end up doing the exact same thing that, <laughs> you know, we've seen a million times. Because, like, that's a thing, too, is, like, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I Again, I, I kind of like those tropes. I like those things. Um, I've written um, really horrible slasher slash horror movies um, that, you know, I read now and I just cringe uh, but you know, I'd, I'd like to say that I'd be new and innovative and people would go see them going, wow, I'd never seen that before. But I'm pretty sure the reaction when people left the theater would be like, yeah, I mean, very similar to X, Y, and Z. Yeah. 
Yeah. You could get them with the rare double fake out, you know, make it look like a cabin in the woods take off and then <laughs> exactly. wrap right back around to standard. I was going to say, so, I mean, cabin in the woods has taught us anything. It's, these are a requirement. So exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. That was, that was, that's another one that I very much enjoyed. I like ones that, yeah, the challenge format. And at the time, now it's been done a million times, but at the time, Scream was, I think Scream was one of the first that did that. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was one of the first where, like, they talked about the tropes and they, they're basically talking to the audience, like, oh, here's the rules of a horror movie. Don't do this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so do you have, um, in your wheel of, of, uh, dreams, do you have a, a dream role that you would want to play? Oh, man. I, I really do love the, the television format these days. So, um, you know, it, I'm, I'm super lucky and it sounds like I'll, I'll give you two. I'll give you the answer that people will accuse me of being a brown nose and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to d- dig deeper, but it really is not far from, the role I have on Lock and Key. The Savini Squad is um, peripheral, uh, and, and, and I'm okay with that. Again, I, as I said, I really like team atmosphere, and I really do love things like Stranger Things. That's you know probably my favorite Netflix show outside of obviously the favoritism of Lock and Key. So really, like I'm I am doing my dream job right now, and I'm so lucky in that regard. But I guess in terms of you know uh, maybe outside of things I've done. And I'm circling this a lot, I believe, with Heavy, the show that I'm trying to develop was, um, I, I, I like that, you know, those character study shows that really get to dig deep into someone and their perspective. Uh, and so I, I, I love to be in something that really explores that and kind of all aspects of someone, what they're like, you know, in, in, in all situations. Um, but you know, then, then I also, you know, would love to be in one of those big budget action films. So I'm, I'm very much all over the map. Uh, but yeah, I, I, ideally I really do like those kind of deeper character work stuff. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's funny. We've only been talking for a little bit, but, um, I can't think of the, the name of the show. Um, uh, I think was it Elijah Wood? Um, where he, oh, the one, um, the one with with his dog. Yes, where his yeah, dog talks to him. Wilfred, Wilfred, Wilfred. That's it. Mm-hmm. I could picture you starring in a show like that. I'm, I'm gay. I only saw uh, a couple episodes of Wilfred. I gotta go back and watch it because I, I very much enjoyed it. But I'll could, take it. Yeah, that's I mean, super fun. and it's and that's exactly it. Exactly, that's a definitely a examining. Uh, uh, things psychologically and there's a little bit of a comedy a- aspect to it. Like, yeah, I, I, I definitely feel that that would work for, for you. Yeah. I thank you. I, I would a hundred percent be ecstatic with that. That's definitely in the wheelhouse of, uh, of my, of my dream thing. Uh, so yeah, right now, I, if they want to do a Wilford reboot, I'm, I'm available. And I, and I see John playing the dog, but that, that's a whole nother story. Uh, thank you. Well, of course, <laughs> you know, <sighs> <laughs> it'd be so, a geeky dog then but you know so so do you have um because you've been in the in the the business for a little bit now and um mm-hmm. do you have any advice that you give to to young people that want to start acting yeah i mean it is uh it's it's very similar i think to the uh ad- advice that uh that my parents gave me which is like i think it's really important to Surround yourself with people that will, you know, give it to you straight, even if it kind of sucks at first. Because the thing about, you know, this industry is you can do everything right and it can not go your way a lot of the time. So try to be as honest with yourself in terms of like, is this something that I love enough to go through that, I would say. Um you know, you can, there, there's always room in terms, in terms of like, uh, honing your craft or getting better. All that, you know, you can kind of, uh, you can kind of get as you go, I think. I do think that you have to have a natural knack for it, maybe, but you can always grow. But I, I guess it's just make sure this is exactly what you really want to do. 
because for most of us, for like 99% of us, it's going to be a long road, but it's so damn rewarding when it works out. So to say, you know, like really look at yourself in the mirror and say, is this worth potentially a lot of heartbreak and, you know, financial struggle and all that stuff? Because, you know, it's going to happen. I've had many, uh, many a notice threatening to turn off my cable, water and electricity. So, uh, but it was, but it was worth it in the end. So that's what I would say. Just make sure this is exactly what you want to be doing. Cool. I, I think that's good advice. Um, yeah. And then the, uh, and this, this kind of goes along the lines of that. And the question that we normally like to wrap up on mm. is how do you measure success? That's a, that's, that's a really wonderful question. Um, I think, it's, it's, you know, obviously there's, there's all the kind of, I don't even want to say the shallow stuff. I'll just say the necessities, right? Like if I'm, if I'm making my rent and I can buy groceries and put gas in my car and I'm doing a job that I love, I am perfectly content and I'm successful. Like when I was doing, again, the first season of this show, I'm not a regular on the show. You know, I, it was it was a great job for me, and I definitely, again, could pay my rent. But I'm, you know, I wasn't laughing all the way to the bank. But, you know, I felt as rich as I've ever felt in my entire life, uh, just coming home from work after a day on the show. So for me, it's, you know, you can pay your rent. You know, you're not, you don't have to be rich, but you're just not panicking about money, and you're happy at your work. Then you're as successful as you can ever be. Hmm, cool. Good answer. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, so where can people find you online? Uh, you know, follow you on the social medias. Yes, I am very good at it not. Um, <laughs> on my, I'm still perfecting my, uh, my, my Instagram. I'm not very good, but there's some fun, uh, behind the scenes stuff if people want to check that out. So on my Instagram, I'm under, uh, Jesse J.D. Camacho, because my middle name is John David. It's very clever. Um, so, yeah, Jesse J.D. Camacho for Instagram. And on Twitter, I'm at Jesse115115, which was my homeroom in high school. That's as creative as that gets. Um, yeah, and uh, you'll you'll see, I would say, one good tweet a year. So that's good. And since I tweet three or four times a day, you can do the math on – how often I hit a home run. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, everyone should go follow you on Twitter right now so they can see you uh, crucified to a tree, apparently. Yes, uh, apparently. Yeah. And you'll see me complain about uh, Survivor a lot because I'm a big Survivor fan. So you'll see a lot of that, too. <laughs> and, and one other thing. So um, it, besides seeing you in Lock and Key, what other of your work would you most want people to take a look at? I, I would definitely say uh, – the show that I did, uh, Less Than Kind, which is, uh, the first season anyway, is on Amazon Prime. Unfortunately, seasons two through four are kind of lost in the shuffle. That's because we had a network change. Mm. But a super fun show. Uh, our, our pilot is, is, is good, but it's not a great representation. So I'd say, you know, like, if you watch, you know, three or four episodes of that show, you get the idea of what it is. Very proud of that. Uh, I also did a movie a couple years ago in Montreal called The Worst Still Together, which was fun with, the uh, writer director this guy named uh, jesse klein super talented and his brother joey is the co-star on that and just a really small indie we did that uh that i was very proud of so yeah thank you just yeah th those would be the two things that i would uh, suggest mm, cool cool all right well on that note boys and girls i will say thank you to jesse for joining us this week and thank you guys um mm. a recommendation would be for you to make sure you go and uh, follow him on Twitter and Instagram and check out Lock and Key, currently streaming on Netflix. Uh, you won't be disappointed, uh, especially if you're a Joe Hill fan. And on that note, as always, thanks for listening. And don't let your cape get caught in the door. Have a good week. <laughs>